Our guest speaker today is uh, W. Travis McMakin. I'm not sure what the W is for, but maybe you can tell us. Um, and he is uh, Associate Professor of Religion at Lindenwood University in St. Charles, Missouri. Um, he was educated at Wheaton College and Princeton Theological Seminary, uh, getting his PhD from Princeton in uh, 2012. He's taught at Lindenwood University since uh, 2011, where he serves as, as I said, Associate Professor of Religion, and he's also Chair of General Studies uh, in the Humanities Department, is it? School. School uh, at Lindenwood. Um, he has a number of publications. Uh, his monograph, The Sign of the Gospel Towards an Evangelical Doctrine of Infant Baptism After Karl Barth, uh, was published by Fortress Press in 2013. And he is the editor with uh, David Congton, of Carl Bart in Conversation, public, uh, published by Pickwick Press in 2014. Uh, Travis has been interested in the theology of Thomas Torrance, he says, ever since he took a class at Princeton from George Hunsinger on recent reformed theology, uh, which featured uh, Torrance. Uh, Travis has been a member of the Thomas F. Torrance Theological Fellowship since 2008. Um, and he also uh, authored an article related to the, uh, the title, The Impossibility of Natural Knowledge of God in T.F. Torrance's Reformulated Natural Theology, which appeared in the International Journal of Systematic Theology in 2010. So we're honored to have uh, uh, Travis McMakin address us uh, today. And the title of his paper is Actualism, Dualism, and Onto Relations. Interrogating Torrance's criticism of Bart's doctrine of baptism. So let's welcome uh, Travis McMakin. Good afternoon. I want to say a special thanks to Gary and the other members of the executive committee for inviting me to be with you all today and for inviting Alistair McGrath to follow me next year. Uh, I don't mind that kind of company at all. Um, I've been wanting uh, an opportunity to elaborate on this topic for a number of years now. I've kind of been bumping up against Torrance's reading of Barth's Doctrine of Baptism for a while, but not having the opportunity to really sink my teeth into it. And so I'm excited to be able to do that more today and to give Torrance uh, something more like his due on the subject. So you heard my title, Actualism, Dualism, and Onto Relations. Thomas F. Torrance was not only one of Barth's most noted students, he was also, as Alistair McGrath says, a major figure in relation to English language Barth reception. This close association of Torrance with Barth makes it all the more surprising when one encounters the admittedly few criticisms that Torrance made of Barth's theology. This essay is about one of those criticisms. In his essay, entitled The One Baptism Common to Christ and His Church, Torrance gives voice to perhaps the most penetrating of these criticisms. He works through an impressive array of biblical and patristic material aimed at establishing, in connection to baptism, what he had already argued more generally in his dissertation, namely that, quote, grace is in fact identical with Jesus Christ in person and word and deed, end quote. In his one baptism essay, Torrance puts this sentiment negatively vis-a-vis -vis the quote-unquote Augustinian tradition, in which, quote, grace is not only distinguished from Christ, but is an intermediate, intermediary reality between God and man, which holds God himself apart from us, end quote. Those who would reject such a disjunction are left, according to Torrance, with a stark binary choice either, quote, return to a sacramental dualism between water baptism and spirit baptism, or pursue an even stronger unity between water baptism and spirit baptism, end quote. Those familiar with the doctrine of baptism that Barth advanced in Church Dogmatics 4.4 can certainly see where this is going. But Torrance goes on to spell things out and thereby avoid any doubt about the, reflect, uh, the referent for his criticism, quote, the former alternative has been taken by Karl Barth, end quote. Torrance includes another twist in this already interesting story. He wants to be clear that this criticism does not warrant a wholesale rejection of Barth's theology. Rather, 
What he finds in Barth's last blast of the trumpet, as it were, quote, seems to me to be deeply inconsistent, end quote, with Barth's understanding of the Trinity and incarnation. Rather than an external criticism of Barth's theology, Torrance understands himself to be making an internal criticism, a criticism of Barth by Barth, or as engaging in an exercise to correct the circumference of Barth's theology by more rigorous connection to its center. What makes the story even more stimulating is that Bart specialists have been at something of a loss when confronted by Torrance's criticisms, and they tend to handle it in one of three ways. The first approach is agreement. John Yoakum, for example, accepts Torrance's point and attaches it to a narrative whereby Bart has, increasingly has increasing difficulty holding together divine and human agency in their proper relationship the further into church dogmatics for that he went, until finally pulling them apart in CD 4.4. I have committed a monograph to the argument that such a narrative of decline is unconvincing and will not rehash the subject here. Second, one might take John Webster's approach and turn the criticism back onto Torrance, arguing that Torrance lacks a sufficiently deep appreciation for Barth's quote-unquote ethical intention. According to Webster, Torrance's account of Jesus' humanity locates all meaningful human action in Jesus and thus evacuates the Christian life of its ethical aspect. Webster represents Barth's account of Jesus' humanity, on the other hand, as upholding that ethical aspect by evoking in the Christian life meaningful human action that corresponds to God's own action in Christ. But this strategy is, rhetorically speaking, something of a red herring and does not finally provide a sufficient answer to Torrance's criticism of Barth's doctrine of baptism. The present essay, though not without a contrastive element, endeavors to hear and understand Torrance's criticism more fully. The third and final approach is taken by Paul Molnar in his work on Karl Barth and the Lord's Supper, where he straightforwardly states, quote, I do not see a Gnostic dualism, end quote, in Barth's sacramental theology. While defense of Barth against Torrance's criticism is not inappropriate, it also does not shed further light on the meaning of Torrance's criticism and its place in Torrance's thought. Writing with the purpose of expositing Torrance rather than Barth, Molnar returned briefly to the subject with a more satisfying discussion. The task remains, however, to explicate Torrance's criticism of Barth as both a criticism that arises from Torrance's own theological commitments and as a criticism of Barth's doctrine of baptism. It is this two-pronged, stereoscopic reading that I undertake in this essay. To accomplish this task, I will interrogate Torrance's criticism by working through a series of four heuristic questions. First, what does Torrance mean when he accuses Barth of baptismal dualism? Second, why did Torrance think that Bart had lapsed into such a dualism? Third, what was Torrance's alternative to Bart's alleged baptismal dualism? Fourth, was Torrance right in his criticism of Bart? And having completed this interrogation, I will conclude by asking a final question. Where lies the disconnect between Bart and Torrance? And just as a side note, I had intended to cut one of those sections for presentation, but Mike Habits told me not to. So if this is long, <laughs> pitchforks go to him. I gotta leave early. <laughs> <clears throat> Section one. What does Torrance mean by dualism? McGrath notes that Torrance's work evinces, quote, a growing concern over the issue of dualism, end quote, beginning in 1962. This is unsurprising because it was during this period that Torrance was at work on one of his most important monographs, namely Theological Science. As Torrance notes in his preface, this volume started its life as a lecture cycle delivered in 1959 at a number of theological institutions in the United States before being published in, quote, a considerably expanded form, end quote, in 1969. The issue of dualism pervades this volume. For instance, Torrance applauds a, quote, healthy rejection of dualism, end quote, on the first page. 
Both Torrance's interest in theological science and his criticism of dualism predate this period, however, even if the idea and language of dualism only here begins to take center stage. Torrance studied with Bart in Basel from 1937 to 1938. His initial plan for his dissertation was to attempt, quote, a scientific account of Christian dogmatics, end quote, which Bart considered, quote, unquote, too ambitious. He also wrote and delivered a lecture cycle on theology and science while teaching at Auburn Theological Seminary in New York during the 1938-39 academic year. In other words, the emergence of Torrance's concern about dualism in the early 1960s is unsurprising insofar as it fits nicely with the trajectory and concerns of his thought from its earliest stages. That his concern about dualism emerged at this point is interesting because this is when Bart was at hard at work on his mature doctrine of baptism. <coughs> Bart delivered the lectures that would comprise Church Dogmatics 4.4 in 1959 to 1960. Furthermore, Bart notes that, quote, a very purpose, oh gosh, that's a long word for this time in the afternoon, perspicacious abstract of these lectures existed and had a fairly wide circulation in several transcripts, end quote. It was during this period that Torrance had a sustained private conversation with both Carl and Marcus Bart on the topic of baptism when they visited Edinburgh in 1966. Bart's publication of his revised revision of these lectures was motivated in part by the desire for his readers to have the full argument and articulation of his position before them rather than simply the precy. The German edition was published in 1967, and the English translation, which was overseen by Torrance as co editor with Jeffrey Bromley, appeared in 1969. This brings us to Torrance's criticism of Bart in his one baptism essay, which was delivered as a lecture in 1970, published in German in 1971, and published in English in 1975. As seen previously, this, crit this criticism was couched precisely in the language of dualism. Thus, it is interesting that Torrance's concern about dualism and Bart's doctrine of baptism grew up together, as it were. This is a pivotal moment in the development of Torrance's theology at which he clarified his own thought through engagement with Bart by developing the concept of dualism as an analytic tool. This tool that Torrance developed proved to be multifaceted. Torrance identifies many different kinds of dualism, tracing their effects through a web of interconnected theological issues. Tapio Lioma helpfully brings together this panoply of dualisms by articulating a three-stage historical typology at work in Torrance's thought. The first is Greek or Ptolemaic dualism, with which it's, with its tendency to distinguish so sh sharply between the sensible and the intelligible that it becomes difficult to conceive of true incarnation. Torrance analyzes patristic Christological heresies in terms of their entanglements with this dualist intellectual framework. The second is Newtonian dualism, which promulgated an improper distinction between absolute space and time on one side and relevant, or, uh, relative space and time on the other. And this led, as Torrance explains, to a mechanistic determinism. Third and finally, these dualisms are overcome by the dynamic engagement with objective reality found in contemporary Einsteinian modes of thought that consequently make it much easier to conceive of true incarnation. The variegated way that Torox develops the concept of dualism, briefly illustrated by Luomo's historical typology and familiar to anyone who has read Torrance's works at any length, raises the rather basic question, what is dualism? Torrance does not answer this question in a straightforward way. As Luoma notes, Torrance, quote, fails to define the concept of dualism with sufficient accuracy, end quote. But Torrance is not alone in this, and his imprecision arises at least in part because, quote, general definitions of the concept are so ambiguous, end quote. That again from Luoma. It would be a mistake to understand Torrance's rejection of dualism as a rejection of all thinking in terms of duality. Torrance maintains clear dualities in his thought, such as the Christological duality, 
between Christ's divine and human natures, or the cosmological duality between God as creator and the creation. So dualism for Torrance is not simply duality. One has dualism rather than duality when the relationship between the two aspects of a duality are not properly conceived. Luoma explains that, quote, the crucial issue for Torrance's account of dualism appears to be the nature of the relation between the poles involved, where dualism distorts the balance between the poles, end quote, such that one subsumes the other. For Torrance, dualism occurs when two things that should be held together in a carefully ordered relationship are no longer understood as such. In such a scenario, one side will overcome the other, or they will become improperly separated. It is hard to ignore the overtones of Chalcedon here, which enjoins us to avoid confusing, changing, dividing, or separating the divine and human natures in Christ. While Torrance affirms Chalcedon, however, his thinking is far more influenced by the Nicene homoousion, that is, the affirmation that the incarnation uh, the affirmation of true incarnation that establishes a unitive, if necessarily differentiated, relation between God and the world. Dualism occurs then when a unitive relation between God and the world as found in the Homoousian is absent from view. Torrance articulates the importance of this connection with reference to Christian thinking about the relation between creator and creation. Quote, <coughs> the distinctly Christian outlook upon the relation of God to the universe took shape as theologians thought through the bearing of the incarnation of the divine Logos, the one God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, uh, while the incarnate Son or Logos through whom all things were made and in whom they hold together is the central and creative source of all order and rationality within the created universe, the typically Torrentine sentence. It is the incarnation, then, and the unitive forms of thought that derive from it, that overcome the properly, improperly disjunctive forms of thought that Torrance characterizes as dualism. Consequently, Luoma is correct when he observes that for Torrance, quote, dualism is theologically reasoned and Christologically based, end quote. Dualism is, therefore, what is rejected when the Nicene homoousion is affirmed. But what then does it mean for Torrance's theology? What shape does this affirmation take? Torrance's rejection of dualism moves in both epistemological and cosmological directions. And for Torrance, the epistemological issues derive from improper cosmological conceptions. The present essay's concern is with the cosmological aspect and how Torrance's rejection of dualism impacts his approach to what he might call, quote unquote, theological ontology. In other words, if we reject dualism and affirm the Logos, what does that mean for theological ontology? There are three interrelated consequences that are uh, pertinent for the purposes of this essay. They are Torrance's interactionism, his integration of Christ's uh, person and work, and his notion of onto relations. First, rather than improperly separating creation from the creator, Torrance advocates an interactionist perspective. He advances this point in opposition to the second Newtonian dualism from the historical typology mentioned before. The Newtonian worldview produced a, quote, sophisticated deterministic outlook, end quote, that effectively shut God out of the world. Of course, Torrance does not think that Newton alone is responsible for this or that it is uniquely a problem of the early modern period. A few pages earlier, he speaks of, quote, the closed predetermination of Aristotelian final causes or the changeless natural law of the Stoics, end quote. The critical point, however, is that all these thought worlds are opposed to, quote, the concept of the creative interaction of God with the temporal order of the universe, end quote. Rather than being apart from the created world, God's transcendence means God's presence in and interaction with the created world. What Torrance finds in thinkers like Einstein and others 
is a conception of the universe that fits with this picture of the created world as, quote unquote, intrinsically open to God's interaction rather than, quote, being closed in upon itself, end quote. Although Torrance does much of his thinking about these matters in the context of a doctrine of creation, he also makes it clear that this thinking is finally controlled by the incarnation. The incarnation demonstrates the interactionist character of God's relation with the created world because it is there that God, quote, interacts with the world and establishes a relation between creaturely being and himself, end quote. In the incarnation, God, quote, asserts the actuality of his relations with us, end quote. Second, and building on the importance of incarnation and especially hypostatic union in his interactionist account, Torrance emphasizes the importance of thinking in terms of internal rather than external relations. He brings this out especially when discussing soteriology, faulting quote unquote Western Christianity for interpreting the atonement quote almost exclusively in terms of external forensic relations and as a judicial transaction in the transference of the penalty for sin from the sinner to the sin bearer, end quote. In other words, sin is understood as an external thing that can be disconnected from the sinner and given to Christ. In Torrance's view, this both minimizes the seriousness of sin for human existence and misunderstands the nature of Christ's saving significance. Instead of such an external view, quote, the incarnation and the atonement are internally linked. For atoning, expiation, and propitiation are worked out in the ontological depths of human being and existence into which the Son of God penetrated in the incarnation, end quote. Salvation occurs as Jesus Christ reconciles human existence to God precisely by living a life of vicarious obedience under the conditions of that existence. His work of salvation is, therefore, internal to his person and unable to be separated from it. Believers share in that salvation precisely by being united with him in the power of the Holy Spirit. Mike Habit summarizes things nicely, quote, Torrance seeks to avoid dualism and its resulted external transactional notion of redemption in his incarnational model of the atonement, end quote. Lest one think that Torrance's concern for thinking in terms of internal rather than external relations is limited to the intersection of Christology and atonement, it is important, third and finally, to discuss Torrance's concept of onto relations. Gary Detto rightly sees Torrance's articulation of onto relations as, quote, a central, if not the central, element in Torrance's approach to theology, end quote. Torrance's basic insight is Trinitarian in nature and pertains to the status of the inter-Trinitarian relations vis-a-vis -vis the shared divine essence. In other words, how do the relations between Father, Son, and Spirit pertain to God's being? For Torrance, quote, these relations subsisting between them are just as substantial as what they are unchangeably in themselves. That is to say, the relations between the divine persons belong to what they are as persons. They are constitutive onto relations, end quote. The interrelations between the three divine persons simply are the essence of the triune God. And the triune God has no substance apart from these relations. But this way of integrating relationality within ontology does not stop for Torrance with the Trinity. Precisely because God is onto-relationally constituted, we should not be surprised to find that creaturely being is similarly constructed. Onto-relational thinking is consequently, quote, applicable in a creaturely way to persons in relation to one another in a manner that reflects the transcendent way in which the three divine persons are interrelated in the Holy Trinity. End quote. Furthermore, human being is constructed not only with reference to relationship with other creaturely realities, but also and primarily with reference to relationship with God. In this way, Torrance's onto-relational thinking brings together his concern for unitive and interactionalist 
rather than dualist thinking, precisely by extending his concern for thinking in terms of internal rather than external relations. Section two, why did Torrance think that Bart had lapsed into dualism? Two moves are necessary in answering this question. First, it is important to document Torrance's tendency to credit Bart with supplying him with, or at least providing fertile ground for the development of, Torrance's own analytic tools. This makes Torrance very sensitive to those places where he feels it necessary to disagree with Bart, and he tends to conceptualize these divergences as lapses or inconsistencies on Bart's part. Second, an account must be given for why it is that Bart's doctrine of baptism triggers Torrance's demurral. What factors contributed to Torrance's interpretation of Bart's mature doctrine of baptism as dualist? First, Torrance credits Bart for overcoming dualism in recent theology. Indeed, Torrance views this as one of Bart's most important achievements. In Torrance's autobiographical accounts, for instance, he speaks of his early encounter with Schleiermacher and the realization that the latter's theology, quote, lacked any realist scientific objectivity, end quote. His reading of Augustine at the same time alerted him to the danger of, quote, powerful Neoplatonic ingredients, end quote that established, quote, controlling presuppositions basically similar to those in Schleiermacher, end quote. His encounter with Bart was more cheering, but despite Bart's rigorously scientific approach, quote, it appeared to be little more than a formal, formal science and fell somewhat short of what Torrance had been looking for, end quote. But then, Torrance encountered Bart's, quote, doctrines of the hypostatic union, end quote, and the Trinity. And this provided the material content that Torrance needed to develop, quote, a coherent and consistent account of Christian theology as an organic whole in a rigorously scientific way in terms of its objective truth, end quote. Torrance nowhere explicitly identifies the problem of dualism in these reflections, and that is understandable, considering that these reflections on a these are reflections on a period of his development before he had clearly conceptualized uh, the problem in dualist terms. But his worries about Neoplatonism in Augustine and the lack of objectivity in Schleiermacher, as well as his concern for thinking about Christianity as an organic whole on the basis of the incarnation, all that is present. These reflections are materially consistent with his account of dualism even if they are not formally thematized as such. Another example comes from Torrance's discussion of Barth's theology and what Torrance calls the quote-unquote Latin heresy. This heresy involves a tendency that Torrance identifies in the Western theological tradition to think, quote, in abstractive formal relations and external relations, end quote. Torrance associates this tradition with figures such as Augustine and Newton, asserting that, quote, its roots go back to dualism that prevailed in patristic and medieval Latin theology, end quote. The alternative is to think in terms of internal relations. Such relations are patterned on the incarnation as explicated by the Nicene Homoousion, which articulates the internal or ontological relation that obtains between father and son in the triune God. Torrance associates this insight with the figures of Athanasius and especially Bart, going so far as to characterize his essay as an attempt, quote, to direct attention to Karl Barth's non-dualist and holistic way of thinking in contrast to the dualist and abstractive modes of thought that came to be built into the infrastructure of Western theology, end quote. Here, Bart is the champion of dualism's rejection and thereby the ground upon which Torrance works to develop his own distinction between internal and external relations. A final example is Torrance's essay on Bart and the problem of natural theology. It is here that Torrance most clearly articulates his distinction between interactionist and dualist accounts of how God relates to the created world. Natural theology, as traditionally conceived, depends on a dualist approach. Quote, in which God is thought of as separated from the world of nature and history 
by a measure of deistic distance, end quote. Traditional forms of natural theology take for granted the separation between God and the created world and then set about trying to bridge that separation from the human side. Bart is the hero of the story once again, rejecting all such attempts and returning focus by way of a rigorously scientific theological method to a properly natural theology. That is, a theology that, quote, thinks rigorously in accordance with the nature of the divine subject and is therefore natural to the fundamental subject matter of theology, end quote. But the possibility of doing theology in this way depends on a key presupposition, namely that theology's subject matter, God, is available to it within the created world. This is where the incarnation's importance comes to the fore because, quote, the incarnation means that the eternal truth of God has entered time and forever assumed historical form in Jesus Christ, end quote. That this has occurred, however, demonstrates the insufficiency of the dualist conception whereby God is separated from the created world. It demands a unitive and interactionist approach, quote, one in which God is thought of as interacting closely within the world of nature and history without being confused with it, end quote. It's welcome to stay. <laughs> Second, Bart's doctrine of baptism triggers censure from Torrance in part because of historical alignment. Despite praising Bart for overcoming dualism with respect to natural theology, Torrance notes that, quote, vestiges of this dualism persisted in Bart's thought, most notably in his understanding of the sacraments, end quote. It is significant in this regard that Torrance's essay on Bart and natural theology was published in 1970, the same year in which Torrance first presented the one baptism lecture where he ex explicitly criticized the dualism of Bart's doctrine of baptism. Dualism means, quote, an operational disjunction between God and the world, end quote. A distinct disjunction that prevents true encounter between God and humanity. Torrance finds such a disjunction in Bart's distinction between baptism with spirit and with water. For his part, Torrance lauds, quote, the mighty living God who interacts with what he has made in such a way that he creates genuine reciprocity between us and himself, end quote. Torrance then makes clear the incarnational foundation of this interactionist way of thinking about the relation between God and humanity. Quote, the profound reciprocity in word and act is fulfilled in Christ. For it is in hypostatic union that the self-giving of God really breaks through to man when God becomes himself what man is and assumes man into a binding relation with his own being, end quote. Rejecting dualism and affirming the incarnation means developing a unitive and interactionist account of the relation between spirit and water baptism. Indeed, Torrance had developed such an account already in the 1950s, as will be demonstrated in due course. Torrance may have hoped that Bart would join him in this constructive task, but on Torrance's reading, Bart remained firmly caught within dualistic patterns of thought. It is likely that Eberhard Jungel's interpretation of Bart's doctrine of baptism played some role in solidifying Torrance's criticism, as it did in the case of others. Jungel published an essay on Bart's doctrine of baptism in 1968. The year after Bart's publication of KD 4.4 in 1967, and the year before the English translation was published in 1969, and two years before Torrance's criticism of Bart's doctrine of baptism as vestigially dualist. In this essay, Jungel argues that a shift has taken place in Bart's theology. From what I have described elsewhere as a sacramental inst instrumentalism to a sacramental parallelism. The distinction between divine and human agency in spirit and water baptism is so sharp on Jungel's reading that Bart correlates the agencies exclusively with the different forms of baptism. So, quoting from Jungel in translation, water baptism is just as exclusively a human action as spirit baptism is exclusively a divine action, end quote. 
The two forms of baptism correspond to each other so that, for instance, the divine act of spirit baptism may elicit the human act of water baptism, but they remain distinct acts that are performed by distinct agents in their respective spheres. Like parallel lines, these acts never meet. Such a thoroughgoing distinction between divine and human action, spirit and water baptism, clearly falls within the boundaries of what Torrance calls dualism. Rather than integrating God and the created world in a holistic, unitive way, Jungel's reading of Barth seems to separate them. Rather than understanding spirit and water baptism as internally related, there seems only to be an external relation. Or, as Torrance also describes this distinction, there is not, quote, an ontological, internal, but merely a moral, external relation. So the difference between ontological and moral. Section three, what was Torrance's alternative to Barth's alleged baptismal dualism? The doctrine of baptism became a focal point for Torrance when he was named in 1954 as convener of the Church of Scotland Commission on Baptism, a post, a post which persisted until the commission completed its work in 1962. This body produced a number of lengthy reports which, taken together, comprise hundreds of pages of material. Torrance certainly left his mark on this material, although the exi exigencies of committee work mean that we cannot take them straightforwardly as his own work. However, Torrance also published a number of essays on baptism in the second half of the 1950s that provide us with a sure touch touchstone of his own thinking on the topic. These essays contain the key moves that will resurface once again in his one baptism essay in the early 1970s. Furthermore, these moves are consistent with his rejection of dualism, which would come into the open in the 1960s. Torrance's doctrine of baptism in these essays prioritizes thinking in terms of internal rather than external relations, especially with reference to the relation between water and spirit baptism. Indeed, one might even say that water baptism's relation to spirit baptism is a constitutive onto relation for water baptism. Such an onto relational account enables Torrance to make the corollary interactionist claim, namely, that it is Jesus Christ who acts as the baptizer. Perhaps the cornerstone of Torrance's doctrine of baptism, conceptually speaking, is the distinction that he notes between two Greek terms, baptisma and baptismos. The latter term is what one would expect the New Testament writers to use, while the former is the one that they actually use. Furthermore, baptisma, the one they actually use, is not attested in pre-Christian Greek literature. This suggests that the early Christian community intended to distinguish in some way its ritual of purification through water from other such rituals. Torrance notes all this, and then takes the further step of supplying a theological rationale to fit this linguistic usage. The term baptisma is preferred on his reading because of its similarity to kerygma. In both cases, one finds a human action, whether that be the church's verbal proclamation of the gospel or its sacramental sealing of that gospel in baptism, so a human action, that serves as a transparent point of access to God's action in Christ. So Torrance, quote, just as kerygma does not call attention to the preacher or the preaching, but only to Christ himself, so baptisma, by its very nature, does not direct attention to itself as a rite or to him who administers it, but directs us at once beyond to Christ himself and to what he has done on our behalf, end quote. Torrance trades on a distinction between water and spirit baptism in this discussion, but the distinction is present only insofar as it is overcome. He speaks of Christian baptism's, quote, double form of baptism in water from below and baptism in heavenly water form from above, that is, in the spirit, end quote. But all of this is secondary, because the practice and theology of Christian baptism, quote, is determined by the event of Christ's baptism, and by all it involved for him on our behalf." End quote. Water baptism, then, is an access point for spirit baptism. 
whereby one is put in touch with Jesus' own baptism by John in the Jordan. This is why, on Torrance's account, it is designated by the term baptisma. Although Torrance does not use the language explicitly here, what he describes is an internal relationship between water and spirit baptism, such that water baptism is related to spirit baptism in an ontological rather than in a merely moral way. Furthermore, water baptism as baptisma cannot be understood as possessing an existence independent of spirit baptism. This ritual of purification with water exists as baptisma in its internal relation to spirit baptism, or it does not exist as baptisma at all. This internal relation is determinative of water baptism's existence as baptisma and is therefore an onto relation. On Torrance's account, spirit baptism refers to how water baptism actualizes in the present Jesus' own baptism by John in the Jordan. Jesus' baptism is important for Torrance because of its unique place in Jesus' history. It stands at an intermediate point, hearkening back to Christ's birth and forward to his death. And as a result, it becomes symbolic of the whole of his saving person and work. For Torrance, Jesus saves by enacting, through the Incarnation, a perfect and vicarious obedience to God. This means that Jesus obeys God in the place of all other human persons, and that salvation is nothing less than being united to Jesus through the Holy Spirit, an internal ontological relation rather than an external moral one. So united to Jesus through the Holy Spirit and thereby sharing in that obedience. Because of the symbolic positioning of Jesus' baptism by John in the story of vicarious obedience, Torrance understands baptism as, quote, above all, the sacrament of that vicarious obedience, end quote. Indeed, even Jesus' baptism by John, a baptism of repentance, was vicarious in that Jesus underwent that repentance perfectly and in the place of sinners. Baptism, then, concerns one's incorporation into, quote, Christ's vicarious baptism, end quote. That includes, quote, all he did to fulfill righteousness from his baptism in the Jordan to his crucifixion on the cross. The payoff of this emphasis on baptism as baptism into Jesus' own baptism, and therefore into the vicarious significance of his whole life and death, the payoff of all of that is the interactionist affirmation that it is Jesus who baptizes. This is because it is not finally the ritual of purification with water that is significant, but how the ritual exists as baptisma, by way of its onto relation with spirit baptism, which actualizes, for the baptizand, Jesus' own baptism and its significance. Consequently, as Torrance puts it, quote, It is Christ in his life act, who is always present with us to the end of the world, so that when we, in his name, proclaim the kerygma, and administer the baptisma, it is actually Christ himself, really and fully present, who acts savingly in his church, revealing himself and baptizing with his spirit." End quote. There is no dualist separation between divine and human action. Rather, water and spirit baptism are connected ontorelationally, and the resulting baptisma is permeated by divine activity. It is Jesus Christ who is the agent of baptisma. All that in the 1950s essays. Moving forward to Torrance's One Baptism essay, one finds much the same material despite some linguistic developments. Torrance foregrounds his understanding of baptisma as the onto relational integration of the Christian ritual of purification with water and Jesus' baptism by John in the Jordan, hence the titular One Baptism Common to Christ and His Church. This language is not new, however. It appeared in the earlier essays in passing, and it also appeared in the 1962 report from the Church of Scotland Commission on Baptism. Torrance also makes central the language of baptism's quote-unquote dimension of depth as a way to describe the integration of the baptismal ritual and its basis in Jesus' baptism. But this language is also not new. Torrance speaks of baptisma's quote-unquote dimension of objectivity in his 1958 essay and quote-unquote dimension of depth 
appears in the Church of Scotland Commission on Baptism's report from 1955. As a way of describing how baptisma should be approached in view of its depth dimension, Torrance advocates what he calls, quote, a stereo understanding of the one baptism, end quote, whereby the two levels of baptisma, the rite of purification with water and Jesus' own baptism, these two levels are integrated such that neither can be entirely understood apart from the other. Another linguistic emphasis that emerges is the importance of koinonia as a way of describing the onto relations that obtain between God and Christians, which is enacted in baptism. To be a Christian means to have your being as such constituted by and in relation to the triune God. This charting of linguistic development in continuity helps to make the point that Torrance is working with the same fundamental material doctrine of baptism in both the 1950s essays and the One Baptism essay. There are, however, two aspects of his discussion in the One Baptism essay that, while not entirely new elements, represent important developments in emphasis. The first of these is how the latter essay frames the discussion of baptism within an analysis of the problem of dualism. This is to be expected, given that Torrance's concern about rejecting dualism developed in the 1960s and came to open expression, especially in the early 1970s. But, as also noted previously, Torrance's concern about rejecting dualism grew organically out of aspects of his thought that are traceable even back to the 1930s. It is thus no surprise to find in his discussion of baptism from the 1950s a brief discussion of, quote, Schleiermacher's radical dichotomy between a realm of sensuous events and a realm of spiritual ideas that denies the very essence of the gospel of incarnation, end quote. Furthermore, this dichotomy denies the incarnation insofar as it disrupts the, quote, binding together into a new unity, end quote, of God and humanity in the incarnation. Here are all the hallmarks of Torrance's understanding of dualism, both in terms of its opposition to the incarnation and an interactionist account of the relation between God and the created order. The later one baptism essay foregrounds this angle of analysis, and this shift in emphasis correlates with Torrance's criticism of Bart. This correlation suggests that Torrance's detection of dualism in Bart's mature doctrine of baptism led him in turn to advance a self-consciously and explicitly non-dualist, interactionist account as an extension of the implicitly non-dualist and interactionist account he provided in the 1950s. Further corroboration arises from the second point concerning development of emphasis in Torrance's one baptism essay vis-a-vis -vis the 1950 material, namely, his increased attention to the, to the distinction between water baptism and spirit baptism. This received only the most cursory discussion in the 1950s material, but Torrance has identified Barth's treatment of this distinction as the central failing of Barth's mature doctrine of baptism, and so Torrance must now address it at greater length. He does so by way of a patristic study that focuses especially on, quote, the anonymous de rebaptismate of the third century, end quote. Although providing a more extensive discussion of this point, Torrance maintains the importance of providing a unitive account of water and spirit baptism, of seeing them in a, quote, binocular way, end quote. Therefore, and just as in the 1950s material, the distinction between water and spirit baptism is raised, albeit in a more sustained form, only to be overcome. As Torrance says, speaking in the context of patristic reflection on baptism, not only of spirit and water, but also of blood, if you're familiar with patristic theologies of baptism, baptism of blood is important. Torrance says, quote, baptism may appear to be divided in a threefold way, baptism in water, baptism in blood, and baptism in the spirit, but actually they are one baptism in Jesus Christ, end quote. Despite linguistic developments and shifts in emphasis, Torrance's doctrine of baptism remains remarkably consistent from its expression in the 1950s to the 1970s. It is Christologically focused from first to last. It is committed to emphasizing the unity of water and spirit baptism, and it's explicitly interactionist. 
consequently, it's also anti-dualist, whether implicitly so in the 1950s or explicitly so in the 1970s. These and other strands of his doctrine of baptism come together at both stages in an affirmation that Jesus is the agent of baptism, which he expresses as follows in the later essay, quote, when the church baptizes in his name, it is actually Christ himself who is savingly at work, pouring out his spirit upon us and drawing us within the power of his vicarious life, death, and resurrection, end quote. Section 4 was Torrance Wright in his criticism of Barth. Answering this question requires making a distinction that Torrance failed to make in his criticism of Barth's doctrine of baptism. On the one side is the question of being. Torrance criticizes Barth for succumbing to ontological dualism in his distinction between water and spirit baptism, such that divine action and human action are not properly integrated in a unit of account. That's his criticism. For his part, Torrance purports to offer an account that unites water and spirit baptism, such that there is an integration of divine and human action. That's one side, the side of being. On the other side is the question of meaning. Torrance also claims that the meaning or significance of baptism requires focusing a doctrine of baptism on spirit baptism and God's activity, rather than on water baptism and the church's human activity. So he writes, quote, While baptism in water is by no means dispensable, so far as our salvation is concerned, we must look to the baptism of the spirit. The whole significance of baptism was seen to be lodged, He's speaking of the patristics in his own voice. The whole significance of baptism was seen to be lodged, not in the due admiration, administration of the rite as such, but in him unto whom we are baptized, end quote. While it is possible that a doctrine of baptism that finds baptism's meaning in its character as a human action is also a doctrine of baptism plagued by an ontological dualism between divine and human action, in other words, problems of meaning can also be problems of ontology, this is not necessarily the case. It is entirely possible to find baptism's meaning in its character as a human action while simultaneously avoiding ontological dualism. Indeed, I argue that Bart has advanced just such a position. As noted previously, Torrance's understanding of Bart's account of the relations between divine and human agency and his mature doctrine of baptism is consistent with Jungel's interpretation. Jungel's position is properly described as parallelist, in op opposition to those interpreters of Bart who advocate a sacramental theology articulated in more traditionally instrumentalist notions. These later interpreters tend to agree with Jungel's explication of Bart's mature doctrine of baptism, including Jungel's positing of a shift in Bart's thought from an earlier instrumentalist position to a later parallelism. They, these other interpreters, simply prefer the earlier material. This interpretation of Barth's thought is insufficient, however. There was no shift in Barth's thought from an early instrumentalism to a later parallel parallelism. Rather, there was a development in the complexity of his thought from an early instrumentalism to a later position that integrated the concerns and surpassed the limitations of the instrumentalist and parallelist dichotomy. Torrance was caught up in this false dichotomy between an earlier instrumentalist Bart who forged ahead in rejecting dualism and a later parallelist Bart who succumbed to vestigial dualism. Like many others, this misdirection led him to undervalue the evidence that Bart was working with a much more subtle understanding of the relation between divine and human action in his doctrine of baptism. I categorize Bart's position with the language of paradoxical identity. In essence, paradoxical identity describes the relationship between divine and human action in terms of neither in terms of divine action working through human action, that would be instrumentalist, nor in terms of divine action working alongside human action. These are the instrumentalist and parallelist positions, respectively. Paradoxical identity, 
builds on the logic of the Chalcedonian definition in an effort to describe the relation between divine and human agency such that they are not confused, changed, divided, or separated. Furthermore, paradoxical identity articulates this relation in actualistic terms that focus on the event or occurrence of divine action rather than on persistent relations between static essences. The eternal son assumed human existence in all of its limitations, thereby enacting a history of human life lived in perfect, obedient, covenant partnership with God. It is therefore proper to speak of the life of that, of the, the, life that the eternal son lived as a human being. The incarnation confesses the identity of divine and human being and action in a paradoxical manner that does not allow for the incarnation to be resolved in a reductionist way to either the human or the divine sides. Just so, paradoxical identity means that when divine action occurs, that is, in the event of divine action, it occurs as human action. The human action is then identical with divine action in a non-reductively paradoxical way. Consequently, the event must be described, when this happens, the event must be described both entirely as a human and entirely as divine, just as Jesus' history is both entirely human and entirely divine. Similarly, baptism can be described as entirely water baptism and entirely spirit baptism, such that the two forms are paradoxically identical. This is the conceptual superstructure that enables Bart to approach the topic of baptism by first describing one side and then the other, spirit baptism and then water baptism. Indeed, he appeals to the logic of Chalcedon in relating the two, at points sounding very much like Torrance, and here's one of them, quote, Baptism with water is what it is only in relation to baptism with the Holy Spirit, end quote. One must maintain the, quote, unity of the two in their distinction, and each of the elements will be misunderstood if either is separated from or mingled together or confused with the other, end quote. Furthermore, and contrary to Jungle's allegation that Bart understands spirit baptism as exclusively divine action and water baptism as exclusively human action, against that, Bart provides a unitive account of divine and human action on both sides. He acknowledges that divine action is not foreign to water baptism and that human action is not foreign to spirit baptism. Both are present in their proper character as theorized by the concept of paradoxical identity. With reference to Torrance's desire for a unitive account of the relation between divine and human action that avoids ontological dualism, it is hard to see how one could be more unitive than this. In fact, the only way to do so would be to promote a straightforward rather than paradoxical identity. But this would be to reduce, uh, to re reduce divine to the human or the human to the divine, thus violating the Chalcedon, Chalcedon logic of the Incarnation. Given that Bart maintains such a deeply unitive account of the relation between divine and human action in his doctrine of baptism, it is necessary to conclude that Torrance's criticism of Bart at the level of being, that is, as ontologically dualist in his doctrine of baptism, this criticism fails decisively. Bart's position does not contain com compromising vestiges of dualism, but articulates a highly complex and subtle account of the relation between divine and human action that overcomes the tension in the Reformed tradition between instrumentalist and parallelist accounts. There remains, however, Torrance's criticism of Barth's doctrine of baptism at the level of meaning. As noted above, Torrance locates the meaning of baptism not in the human action of baptizand or church to undergo or administer water baptism respectively, he locates the meaning of baptism in Jesus Christ as the administer of baptism in all its dimensions of death. The contrast to Bart at this point is striking. For Bart act, carefully avoids speaking of water baptism as a divine act, even if, as just described, he does not deny the involvement of divine action. He avoids speaking of it as such precisely in order to emphasize water baptism's meaning as a human act. He highlights this at the head of his section that explicitly addresses water baptism's meaning. 
quote, the meaning of baptism which we now seek is the meaning of human action as such. That is, the human act of water baptism as it responds in faithful obedience to God's act of spirit baptism. Furthermore, Bart worries about the specter of docetism in much the same way that Torrance worries about the specter of dualism. The danger in an account of baptism for Bart is that its character as a human act will be evacuated of meaning such that the proper relationship between water and, spiritual, and spirit baptism, characteristically human and characteristically divine action, not exclusively, characteristically, breaks down this relationship. Rather than understanding each side in its integrity, they are instead confused, changed, separated, or divided, to draw once more on the terms of the Chalcedonian definition. The consequence is that baptism becomes, quote, a strangely competitive duplication of the history of Jesus Christ, of his resurrection, of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, end quote. When it comes to the question of where to locate baptism's meaning then, Torrance and Bart are diametrically opposed. This naturally raises the question of why they should be so. Perhaps it is a question of context, such that practical theologians should be left to adjudicate between them based on the missionary needs of particular churches in particular times and places. Perhaps it is a question of where one plants one's feet among the various discussions of baptism in the New Testament. On this score, Bart is firmly planted in the ethical perspective on baptism that he finds in Romans 6 especially, whereas Torrance is invested in his conjectures concerning the reason for the use by New Testament authors of the strange term baptisma rather than the more common baptismos. However, both of these avenues for reflection are finally variations on the notion that when it comes to differences between Bart and Torrance, those differences are simply matters of emphasis. Or to use a turn of phrase from John Webster, the differences are, quote, descriptive rather than principled, end quote. Section five, where lies the disconnect between Bart and Torrance? This essay has undertaken to explicate Torrance's criticism of Bart as both a criticism that arises from Torrance's own theological commitments and as a criticism of Bart's doctrine of baptism. That work is now complete. I have articulated how important themes in Torrance's theology, like the rejection of dualism, onto relations, came together in his criticism of Bart's doctrine of baptism. And I have set that rejection against the backdrop of Torrance's own doctrine of baptism. Furthermore, I have argued that Torrance's criticism of Barth's doctrine of baptism as, comprised, as compromised by vestigial dualism does not succeed, although there is a very real disagreement between Torrance and Barth on the question of where to locate the meaning of baptism, whether in divine or in human action. Such disagreements between Bart and Torrance are usually treated as matters of divergent emphasis rather than matters of material difference. Although there is some risk of overemphasizing the distance between Bart and Torrance, an analysis of the relationship between their respective bodies of theological work cannot rest with an appeal to divergent emphasis. Instead, we must penetrate to the theological structures and conditions at work in their respective thought worlds that produce this apparent divergence in emphasis. George Hunsinger's reflection on Bart and Torrance offers a productive starting point. He couches matters in terms of his motifs. And this is an extended quotation. Bart's early theology has been called revolutionary theology in the making and the theology of crisis. From Torrance, however, one cannot help but feel that one is somehow getting revolutionary theology without the revolution and the theology of crisis without the crisis. The energy, dynamism, and sense of collision which enter Barth's theology by way of the actualistic and particularistic motifs never quite come through in Torrance's account. Instead of actualism and particularism enlivening the objectivism, the objectivism is allowed to mute and soften the actualism and particularism. That's the end of the quote. Much of the differences that Hunsinger identifies here 
can be explained as a matter of emphasis or even of style. But Hunsinger also lays his finger on the headwater of these various divergences, namely the question of actualism. To be clear, the issue is not that Barth's thinking was actualist and Torrance's thinking is not actualist. It's not what I'm saying. If actualism is a habit of mind that thinks in terms of dynamic relations rather than static conditions, then Torrance's thought is marked by actualism. How could it be otherwise for someone who so emphasized relations in his theology, whether internal, onto relations as a positive value, or external relations as a negative value? The deep divergence between Bart and Torrance, then, is a divergence between two different kinds of actualism. To put it simply, Torrance's actualism essentializes relations, while Bart's historicizes essences. As noted in the previous discussion of onto relations, Torrance conceives of the relations between the three persons of the Trinity as constitutive of the divine essence. This basic insight is not restricted to the divine being, however, and Torrance also thinks of creaturely being as onto relational. The relations that obtain between different creatures, aspects, and levels of creaturely reality, and especially those between the creature and God, are constitutive for the creature's being. This takes the traditional concept of essence and enriches it with a new relational dynamism, which Torrance understands as fitting given recent developments in physics. This essentializing of relations bears fruit in Torrance's Christology in his architectural distinction between discussions of, and I'm quoting section headings here, the once and for all union of God and man, that's one section, and the continuous union in the life of Jesus. Those are sections that you find in his incarnation volume. Torrance intends to provide a unitive account of who Christ is, that is, his person or being, and what Christ does, that is, the saving significance of his life or how he relates to others. This essentializing of relations is also evident in Torrance's assessment of Barth's significance. For instance, he thinks that one of Barth's, quote, most important contributions to Christian theology was the way he combined the patristic emphasis upon the being of God in his acts and the reformational emphasis upon the acts of God in his being." End quote. In each of these cases, the categories of what a thing is, being, and how a thing relates to others, action, are integrated, such that it is impossible to consider being without understanding relation as ingredient to being. In other words, Torrance essentializes relations. Bart puts into place a different form of actualism insofar as he historicizes essences. In a passage that sounds very much like Torrance's approach, Bart writes that Jesus' being, quote, is a being, but a being in a history, end quote. But Bart elucidates this statement in a way that Torrance does not. For instance, Jesus' being as the unity of God and humanity, quote, takes place in the event of God and the concrete existence of this man, end quote. The central place that the language and concept of event has in Barth's actualism sets him apart from Torrance. Indeed, Torrance criticizes Barth for this, asserting that it is, a, it is a feature of Barth's thought that, quote, has its roots in an Augustinian and Lutheran dualism, end quote, and results in a lack of attention to, quote, the ontology of creaturely structures, end quote. But this event character has been central to Barth's thought from the first to last, giving Barth's actualism a more radical aspect than Torrance's. To return to Barth's Christology, he writes of Jesus Christ that, quote, his being is his history, and his history is his being, end quote. Here is the historicizing of essences. Bart equates Jesus' being as the incarnate Son of God with the history that he enacts. This is the natural consequence of Bart's rejection of the concepts of divine and human natures with reference to both divine and human being. That happens in CD 4 too. Consequently, it is not that Bart incorporates a concern for relation into his thinking about essences, as does Torrance. Rather, Bart historicizes essences by refusing to attribute any content to notions of divinity or humanity 
except by way of Jesus' history. In order to talk about a union between God and humanity in Jesus, one must describe the history, the series of events, in which the union, or using his terms, quote unquote, common actualization occurred. Recognizing that Bart historicizes essence in his actualism decisively subverts the categories by which Torrance interprets and criticizes Bart's doctrine of baptism. Recall Torrance's concern that salvation be understood in terms of internal rather than external relations, which he articulated through deep engagement with Bart. The distinction that he drew there was between in internal relations that are ontological and external relations that are quote unquote merely moral. The distinction makes sense on traditional ontological grounds, which is why it has such sweeping explanatory power in Torrance's hands. There it stands as a bulwark against the dualism that would separate the ontological from the existential, the realm of being from the realm of history and action. But one important consequence of Barth's historization of essences is that what were external moral relations become internal ontological ones. There is no hidden ontological reality behind our existential actuality, no being behind our history and actions. There is no internal ontological relation to, God, to be had with God that is not enacted historically, or, as Torrance would say, that is not an external moral relation. Consequently, Torrance's criticism of Barth's doctrine of baptism cannot be understood as a criticism internal to Barth's theology. For Barth, Water and spirit baptism relate according to the logic of paradoxical identity, which describes the relation between divine and human action in the event of their simultaneity. It is impossible to conceive a closer relation between God and humanity on the grounds of Barth's actualism than such an event of simultaneity, in which faith perceives and confesses that divine action occurs precisely as human action. Thank you very much. <laughs>